All right. Good morning, everybody. I like to thank the grace of heaven, the virtues of the masters, and <coughs> the uh, mercy of the grand predecessor, predecessors, transmitters, temple masters for lectures for allowing me to for giving me this opportunity to uh, lead a discussion on today's topic, which has to do with if you look on the screen called the four immeasurable minds and the four great vows okay this is the outline all right okay let's get this out of the way okay so first I'm gonna give you a little intro talk about the background what those t well mainly the four immeasurable minds okay because the four great vows is no they're just vows right now okay well they're 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 a result Let's put it this way: they would be a result of the four measurable minds. Uh, so, so the four measurable minds are, are are the bulk of where I will be giving you the definitions, meanings, its attributes, qualities, etc. And also, the four measurable minds, as we all know, or as you know, have four components, and how they interact, interrelate, interrelationship to each other. That's very important. Okay. And then, of course, I'll talk about I'll, that will I'll lead that will lead you to the next section, which is the, about the four great vows or four bodhisattva vows, and then also what's its relationship to the four measurable minds or four states of mind, and then I'll conclude. Okay, so background. Okay, the literal translation I I didn't do the Sanskrit in here. I should have typed it in. It's called it's called bodhihara bodhi up oh, sorry. Brahma, Brahm, Brahma Vihara. That's the the Sanskrit term. Okay, Brahma Vihara. Okay, that 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 that's the the Sanskrit term uh, found in the uh, sutras uh, in, in the Buddha Sutra. Uh, also outside of it too, uh, in Hinduism, which we'll talk about later. Next next point. Um, it, it little translation means the abode or dwelling, the four dwellings of Brahma. That's what it means, Brahma Vihara. Okay, Brahma is the equivalent. We could say deity, God. Okay, it's a God. Okay, it's like a God. I mean, specifically, you know, in Hinduism, Brahma is the creator God. Okay, that doesn't matter. Okay, but it's also known. You know, can be translated in several ways. It's called the four divine abodes. You can call it that. Four sublime states, four immeasurable, four boundless, infinite, limitless states. Okay, all right, all that. Okay, it encompasses all that. All right, now. The four immeasurable minds. We'll use four immeasurable minds. You know, you know, you know, as a substitute. Okay, we'll, we'll select that. Okay, okay. <clears throat> it's these are actually pre-Buddhist concepts. So that means Buddha did not invent them, or did not, yeah, you could say invent them, or introduce these concepts. Actually, they already exist in other religions: Hinduism, Jainism, the Upanishads, for example, as part of Hinduism. They they talk about components of it okay all right okay so 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 those ideas these ideas that the concept of these four immeasurable minds sublime states already existed before Buddha before Buddha okay but what happened but but let's go to point C but there's a big difference and you can say that's a it's a different I would say interpretation or different way yeah you can say Viewing it or, or uh, applying it, maybe that's another term to say. Okay, uh, anybody know what Dika Nikaya is? Oh, anyway. <laughs> Dika Nikaya is the second basket of the Tripitaka. Okay, that's the sutras or suttas in Pali. Okay, sutras. It's a collection of 34 plus discourses. They call them basket. It's a collection. Okay, so there's a lot, and I think the 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 Diga Nikaya, okay, is the it, 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 it's the it's the first of the five collections of the of the sutras, okay? And within the Diga Nikaya, there are like 34 separate discourses, if you will, sutra discourses, okay? And I think it's in talking in terms of the four immeasurable minds, I think it's the 16th or 18th, I forgot, it's one of them. Okay, it doesn't matter, you can look it up. Okay, okay, now what happens is that Buddha said, okay, that the difference between what he is teaching, or yeah, you can say teaching about this concept of the four immeasurable minds as part of 
the cultivation process, you can say, or you know, yeah, you can say cultivation process, is that in non-Buddhist practices, it only leads to a rebirth, okay, into the world of Brahmas, at best, if you, if you could do that, all right, okay, if you practice it well, the four immeasurable minds, you know, and and in those days, the the uh, the, the 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 most common way of practice is they do meditation first. They meditate on these four sublime states, four measurements, and then they they try to af uh, affect others within their circle first, and then you know expand it outward. Okay, so so that's their their practice. Now, in terms of external, in terms of actual practice, that's no different from Buddha. But there's a key component, key difference. Buddha's practice is, on the other hand, is this: is that it will lead to turning away, that means, uh, uh, you know, not become attached, that's what it means, dispassion, cessation, quieting, direct knowledge or direct insight. Ah, oh, jeez, <laughs> I misspell. It's V-I-P-A, Vipassayana, Vipa, ah, that doesn't matter, okay, that doesn't matter. All right, okay, ooh, why, why is that? Add, okay. Wait, is that the right term? Ah, it doesn't matter. Okay, I thought I have a typo. Vipas, vipasyana. Yeah, vipasyana. That's right. Okay, I think it's yeah. Um, it, it, it's Sanskrit between Sanskrit and Pali is slightly different. Okay, all right, and also leads to enlightenment and nirvana. Now, based on his first discourse or the no, the Eightfold Noble Path. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's very important. All right. Okay, now Buddha said. The four states refer to an awake state of mind, namely the awakened bodhi mind, also known as, or also called bodhisita. Okay, bodhisita, which is the precursor for complete enlightenment and liberation. Okay, so so it has to do, it, and somehow it's linked, or it's a part. Maybe that's a better say. It's a part of our bodhi mind. Very important. Okay, very important concept. So this is the new twist that Buddha expounded about the four immeasurable minds. Okay? All right, so it's very important. All right, point E. The four states are also eternal. It means timeless, boundless, infinite, limitless, because they are what? The direct manifestations of the four virtues of nirvana. Okay, you can look up what they, what they are in Appendix A. Okay, page four. Okay. And this, this is a direct result of point D, okay? The previous point, all right? Because it has to do with our Bodhi mind. Get it? Okay? The Bodhi mind, what is the Bodhi mind then? Well, that's a separate topic. Maybe I should put a definition down there. It's actually really, you can say, it's the manifestation of our Buddha nature. That's, it, you can say that, okay? It's, it's, it's the, it's, now we say mind, that means it's as opposed to what? The conscious mind, get it? The human mind, human nature mind. Understand? Okay, there's a distinction. All right? Okay, that's what we mean by Bodhi mind. Okay, very important. And also, point F, it's the precursor and foundation of the four gate or Bodhisattva. Okay, so that's that's the link. Okay? All right, so we will, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it at the near the end. Okay? Okay, now let's go to definitions, meanings, attributes. This could be a little bit difficult to follow because there's a lot of information in here. I try to make it into like a uh, table in Excel. I don't have time for it. You guys can do it if you want, but uh, anyway, it's uh, I spent too much time doing this. It's not worth it. Okay, so, all right. Okay, now the four measurable minds, okay? Now, there are four, four, four components. Now, within each component, I'm going to have A, the definition, B, its attributes. It's like that further, more detail, more information, okay? But then C, there are similar traits, but they're negative. In Buddhism, it's also called near enemy. <laughs> near enemy, you know, enemy close by, okay? Uh, that's the way they phrase it, okay? Point D, opposite traits, also called far enemy. That means it's like, it's like opposite, just the... Para, right? Para, in, what's that? is that Latin or Greek? I think that's Latin, right? Ah, Greek, it means opposite, okay? And then E, potential result, if we're not careful, if, if we're not mindful, etc., etc., or a trap to avoid, 
and F, additional qualities. Okay? So a lot of information, all right? So there are six, six sub, sub points under each, uh, for, each, for each of the four components, okay? So the first one, it's loving kindness called loving that's the first immeasurable mind so <clears throat> so in the glossary uh, I don't want to go to that we, we we say it's you know limitless we use this because it's immeasurable right we say well, we say it's infinite loving kindness okay we, we use that that uh, adjective to describe that okay so, so so just understand that okay so, so A, what's a simple definition at a very basic level? It just means you wish others to be happy and to be loved, right? You, you want others or, or everybody, okay? Now, now this others, I, I got tired of typing, so I, I said it, it, it met, implies sentient beings. So it just it doesn't mean just humans. It applies also to animals. Make sense? Okay, all right. Actually, sentient beings is even broader if you want to expand. It applies to divas and the underworld spirits also. Okay, okay, but, 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 okay, all right. Okay, actually, if you really want to <coughs> apply it completely, that's what it means, okay? Now, attributes, what are some of its attributes? Yeah, you want others to be happy, to be loved, to feel loved, to feel, you know, you know, wanted, etc., etc. okay? It just means that we are benevolent. You, you want to have goodwill, or benevolence, and unconditional love and kindness for all sentient beings, okay? That's much more broader. Okay, now, remember I said C and D, well, C, D, and E are not good, okay? So, so basically, points B and C are like next to each other, okay? One's more positive, the other one's a little bit more negative, get it? That's why I say it's similar or negative traits, near enemy. Okay, that's why it's near. Okay, and then A and D are opposites. Okay, A and D. So that's how you read it, right? Okay, unfortunately, it's not in the table, so it's, you know, it's, you got to remember that. Okay, all right. So what's the similar trait, but it's really negative? Okay, so we say it's conditional love, selfish love, greed in this case means self contentment or happiness. You just want happiness for yourself. Get it? Okay, I mean, I mean, some people say that's not bad. I mean, you know, what's wrong with having having happiness for yourself, right? So that's why I'm saying that's why it's called near enemy. Get it? It's it's a little bit on the gray area side. It's not hundred percent bad, right? Not 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 totally bad, but it could have negative connotations. Make sense? That's what they call it. Similar trait, but it's negative. Understand? Okay, all right. So, and then D. Well, that's the total opposite to A. Total opposite to A. I, ill will, or, or to B, even to B. Okay, you know, ill will. You 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 want others to be unhappy. You want others to be angry. You want others to be hateful. Woo! <laughs> that's really bad, right? So that's D is really really bad. Okay, all right. So so that's you know so so that's okay. Now now there, there's a reason why I did this because. It'll be in part four. It'll come a little bit clearer, okay? So this is a different way of looking at things, okay? Buddha nature stuff, okay. Point E, what's point E? We say it's potential trap or result, okay, to avoid. Well, why is that? So if we just have, you know, say, okay, yeah, loving, loving, you know, kindness. But if we do it on the C level, I, you know, that, you know, gray area, not 100%, pure, you know, good or whatever you want to call it, okay? We can fall into a trap, get it? Or result in a trap, which is we become attached. Attached to our, what? Self-contentment or selfish love, right? All that, okay? Or exaggeration of positive quality. It says, hey, I, I love you so much. I'm so kind to you. And you become... You know, it's an exaggeration. Sometimes you overdo it, over the top. Get it? Okay, so that's a trap to avoid. Okay? Trap to avoid. All right, if we don't do it properly, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay? We could potentially, if we don't do it properly, if we don't understand loving kindness properly, okay? You know, with a proper mindset, that's very important, which I'll talk about in the fourth component, which, which kind of 
guides every uh, guides the, the first three. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, so so f. I'm just a further additional quality, just further elaboration. It, it just means that loving kindness, this mindset, this sublime state, this it's non-conditioned goodwill. Oops, sorry, non-conditioned goodwill towards heart, and it's a detached and self unselfish or selfless interest in the welfare of others, and it overcomes clinging to a negative state of mind, which is, would be like this, okay? All right, would be like part E, okay, point E, okay? That it just means it's non-conditioned, it's very important, okay? It has to be non-conditioned, and it has to be a, a detached. That means you're not attached, right? Not attached, not obsessed, not, not, not dwelling on that, okay? That, that's very important, okay, all right? And it's unselfish, you, you know, you want people, you, you, you want others to be happy and love, and it's not and it's not because you do it out of a selfish interest. Get it? Selfish interest. I mean, now, category. <laughs> I mean, example would be, ah, uh, you know, I love my children. Why? Because they're my children. <laughs> so you know, and I don't care about the other children. They have their own parents. So you know, so so that kind of distinction, even though, technically. We say, hey, that's that's okay. That's common. That's the way it should be, right? That's the way it should be, right? I mean, that 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 that's how society works, right? We have to be very careful because it's kind of like in that gray area once again, okay? So you have to be very careful, okay? Okay, we shouldn't, I'm saying, dwell on those subtle distinctions or 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 barriers. Maybe that's a better term, okay? But but anyway, okay. So the ideally. Uh, which we'll get to the fourth component. That that's kind of the fourth component kind of ties everything together. Okay, it's really the 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 guy, the ultimate, or uh, the guy that harmonizes all four, all three, uh, all four components. Okay, it doesn't matter. All right. Okay, let's go to the second component, which is compassion or mercy, mercyfulness, compassion. So there's a difference between loving kindness and compassion, right? We all know the difference. I hope. <laughs> Uh, one of the differences means that compassion. You don't want to be, you don't, you don't want to see people suffer, or, or, or in this case, it's sentient beings. Okay, and so so that not just people, it's animals too. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I just want to make it clear. You want others to be free from suffering. Okay, that's all. Okay. Uh, further elaboration. You, I. It means identifying the suffering of others as one's own. Wow. Empathy with suffering of others and feels an urge to help or to <laughs> alleviate their suffering. Understand? So it's like saying you put themselves, you, when you see people suffer, not, not, you see, you, yeah, okay, when you see people suffer or sentient beings suffer, you not only you know, say, oh, you don't want them to suffer, you know, that, that's very, very basic, but you can empathize, meaning that you can put yourself in their shoes. That's another way of saying. It. Okay? So like if you are pain, no, literally it's like if you are in pain, I am also in pain. Almost like that. Okay? I mean that that would be the highest level. Okay, that's what a bodhisattva would, would feel. Okay, a Buddha. All right. Okay. Now the um, the what's that? What what C means? C is the is the Trait that's kind of, uh, you know, gray area trait, okay, it could be negative, it, you know, it's called near enemy, okay, near enemy, Let, let's use that term, near enemy, that's a new term we use, okay? It just means we have sentimental pity with no urge to help others. What does that mean? What is sen sentimental pity? Yeah, it means emotional. Yeah, I see somebody suffering, so I feel, I do feel, it. you know, it's emotional, but you don't, you don't feel that you can do anything to alleviate that. Make sense? So it's like a little bit one step away, a little bit further away. Now, it's not wrong. Technically, that's not wrong. Morally speaking, that's not wrong. Morally speaking, right? Even ethically speaking, that's prob probably not wrong either, right? But it, it's it kind of like it's on that borderline. Get it? Because even though you say you feel, you emotionally speaking, sentimental, right? Emotionally speaking, yeah, you, 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 you do feel pity. You, you, you feel bad. You can say you feel bad. Okay? But yet, you do nothing about it. Something like that. 
So we watch on the news all the time, right? We see, you know, disaster to victims. We feel bad. Oh, okay, we donate. Okay, okay, okay. That, that maybe that kind of like ease our conscience a little bit, <laughs> okay? And then, you know, it's practical, you know. They do, people, you know, in disasters do need monetary or material aid, etc. So that's not wrong either, right? But remember, it says no urge to help others. Okay, so that's very important, all right? Condition, okay. All right, now, the opposite, the far enemy is you're cruel <laughs> you're totally absolutely cruel you have you know you know it's, that's obviously the opposite right okay you want others to suffer oh my god <laughs> you're sadist whatever okay all right so so we kind of right okay and what's the pitfall that we have to be careful to avoid it's just called it's called condescending pity or condolence without empathy Oh, you hear somebody died or somebody, you know, tragedy. Uh, I offer my condolences. But it's like lip service. It's not really sincere or actually you don't feel their pain. You just say it because it sounds nice. Or you say it because that's the protocol. Make sense? So that's a trap, right? So a lot of it, it becomes not meaningful. Get it? Insincere, not me. I, I, I talk about that. There's a sincerity component, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, uh, okay. So we kind of understand, right? The nuances, you know, the lot of grip, you know, overlaps, whatever. Okay. Point F. Actually, the ultimate goal of this compassion and mercy component, or this <coughs> immeasurable mind, is to extinguish, eliminate all suffering by ending the process of karmic rebirth i.e. samsara, and the suffering or dukkha that comes along with it. Okay, now we'll, we'll talk about uh, what, what that is embodied later on, okay? Okay, let's go to the third component, uh, because I'm running low on it. Okay, it's called happy joy. <laughs> happy joy. <laughs> sounds like a, I don't know, sounds like a, like a drug or something, I don't know. <laughs> happy joy, you know, happy joy drug, whatever. Yeah, I mean, that would be a great drug name, right? <laughs> happy joy. <laughs> Okay, it also means sympathetic or vicarious. Anybody know what vicarious joy means? Vicarious? I, you know, you, you, how can I say? You experience, yeah, it's, it's like, once again, it's like, almost like putting yourself in their shoes and you experience what they are experiencing. That's something like that, okay? Something like that. All right, okay. Okay, the... Basic definition, it means to rejoice in the fortunes and happiness of others. That's all. I mean, the basic level, okay? A little bit more detail level, expanded level of <coughs> explanation is the sympathetic joy in the potential of bliss and happiness of all sentient beings that they can all become Buddhas. Ooh, that, that's, that's very high level. That's extremely high. Explain, right? Okay. Okay, I think that's kind of self-explanatory. Because all sentient beings have the potential, right? To attain enlightenment or become Buddhas, right? So, so there should be, we should be rejoicing in that, right? Make sense? Okay, and, and okay, all right. Then now comes point C, which is near enemy, <laughs> near enemy. Good term, huh? Near enemy, you never heard that term. I, I didn't hear it until I researched a little bit into it. It's, Affection? Hmm, people say affection. How can affection be wrong? Ah. See, the key, the key is, it's, it's, you can say it's neutral, but it's gray area once again. Because affection is kind of, could be conditioned, conditional, that's what I'm trying to say. Right? I have affection for my children. I don't have affection for the other children. You know, you know, so stuff like that, okay? My favorite people I have affection for, or whatever. You know, so, you know, so, so it kind of, it's like a gray area, make sense? So we gotta be careful about that. So Buddha's, Buddha, okay, in his 45, nine years of teaching, he never say to his disciples, oh, you're the top 10 disciples, you're my affection, I affect, have more affection for you than the other disciples. Never said that, okay? So, so but as we humans, that's normal, right? That's normal. I have a pet, I'm very affectionate to the pet. I, you know, whatever, whatever, that's my, or, you know, all those nuances, okay? I understand? So that's what I mean. Acceleration. What's acceleration? Hmm, 
you just feel very good. <laughs> feels good. Feels good. It's accelerating. Well, you can say exciting. Exciting. Something feels good. We're happy, joy, right? We're happy. Uh, yay! The U.S. won. The U.S. won the Women's World Cup. I'm exhilarated. Mm hmm. See, once again, that that's a how can I say? Or 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 or, or yay! I our team won. Your team lost. You know stuff like that. Get it? Okay, acceleration. So be careful. All right. Even though technically, morally, ethically, there's nothing wrong with acceleration or excitement. There's really nothing wrong or affection for that matter, right? So we gotta be careful with these near enemies, okay? Hypocrisy. Well, what is hypocrisy? It has many meanings, but this time I'm just talking about lip service. Oh, I'm happy for you, but mm, you really deep side. You don't care. <laughs> You're just saying it because it sounds nice. Everybody's saying it. It's protocol, right? It's it's etiquette. See, you get it. It's condition. In other words, everything's okay. All right. Understand? Okay. Now, the opposite, the worst part is, oh, we're envious, we're jealous, we're, we're greed. What, what's greed? In this case, it means we're self-centered. We, we're ego, egotism. Me, I just care about me. <laughs> okay? Self-centered, you know, you know I'm, I'm just happy for myself or whatever, okay? Or can't accept the happiness of others, okay? So that's very negative, right? Okay? Negative qualities or opposites or the far enemy. Okay, what is the trap? If we don't, if we're not careful, and we just, you know, have great affection, acceleration, excitement, it could lead to what? Delusional or ignorant bliss, which leads to indolence. Anybody know what indolence means? Uh, one of the definitions is laziness. Sometimes we don't do nothing. We just feel, yeah, I'm just happy, and I don't care. I, I mean, not I don't care. I don't do anything else, okay? So that's a trap that we have to be careful. Okay? All right, now, the deeper, the, the, the broader <coughs> uh, understanding of, the, of this component, happy joy, vicarious joy, is that you rejoice in the progress of others, of sentient beings, okay? I mean, well, uh, yeah, on their spiritual path and learning. That's really the higher level. Understand? The higher, higher level. Okay? Okay, that's what truly means by happy joy or vicarious joy. It's not just, oh, you know, I'm happy for you, you know, that you are rich, you're pretty, you're whatever, whatever, powerful, famous, whatever. That's not important, okay? That's not the, 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 the more higher, the, the, the highest level. The highest level is that, uh, that sentient beings, other sentient beings, you know, will attain, will, 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 yeah, will attain, will, that are embarking on their spiritual path and will attain enlightenment, okay? All right, that's the higher level. Okay, uh, now comes the fourth component. It's called equanimity. Yeah, that's a hard term to really, um, um, how can I say, define because it encompasses many, many things. Okay, all right. Uh, on the base level, base fundamental, it's even-mindedness, impartiality, non-differentiation, and unperturbed, meaning not influenced or not disturbed. Okay, Unaf not affected. Okay, by a lot of things. Okay, okay, and, and which with the point B is, it's relinquishment, renunciation to go a little bit more deeper, relinquishment of, of what actually, of your ego. Okay, uh, I'll talk about the, of the four marks. Okay, the four marks of existence. Ah, uh, I didn't put that in the appendix, but. We all know, uh, uh, I'll talk about it later. It, it's actually, it's not just impartiality, even-mindedness, that's, you know, you don't go into a rage or you don't go into sorrow or joy even. Yeah, that's very interesting because we got, it's tranquil state of res mind with respect to the eight winds. What's the eight winds? Eight winds. Winds from eight directions? No. Look up, look, look up at Bendix B. I mean, there's, uh, yeah, do we need to go into that? I mean, it, it's 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 a it's a term that we rarely use. It just means they are okay. Let, let's go. Let's go to the let's go to the appendix B. Okay, oops, right here. Eight winds are what influences. Remember, I say unperturbed, right? Eight influences that fan the passions and 
obstructs one or hinders or prevents us uh, uh, from advancing along proper path of alignment. Okay, okay, and and th and they are pairs. They're eight. Okay, so it's pairs of four. The first two are a pair: gain or loss, prosperity or decline. Okay, so that's you know positive, negative, right? Gain and loss, prosperity and decline. That's positive, negative. The th three and four: honor and disgrace, or esteem and defamation. Okay, that's that's pairs, right? Okay. Five and six, acclaim or praise or censure or ridicule, right? You know, we all like this. We all like to be honored, you know, or held in, be held in high regard, right? We all don't like disgrace. We don't like to be defamed, right? Okay, acclaim. We all like praise. Who doesn't like praise? And we certainly don't like censure or ridicule or, or ridicule, sorry, ridicule or Criticism, you can say criticism, okay? And then the last two, joy, uh, seven and eight, joy or pleasure and sorrow and suffering. None of us like suffering or sorrow, right? So, so these are opposites, right? But they're pairs. Sometimes they're positive and negative, right? Okay, so these are called the eight winds. So when I say equanimity with respect, a tranquil state of mind, remember? With respect to these eight winds, that means these eight winds or these you know, four pairs of positive, negative uh, qualities or traits or whatever you want to call them, or influences will not disturb us or will not influence or affect us or get us wowed up. Get it? Okay, that's, that's, that's the... So for mm -hmm. winds, can we say the emotions? Uh, they're, Im they're, I think they're more than emotions. They're, they're, they're you know, a praise is not a emo it's it's how we react or how we think even okay think react or you know it, it, the eight winds are just influences or or qu not qualities <laughs> or traits or quote unquote things that kind of like can bother us okay or can right okay can bother us okay or can you know, vex us, okay, all right, okay, so, so it's not just emotion, okay, it's, I mean, you can say joy and pleasure, yeah, that's an emotion, yeah, sorrow, that's an emotion, but praise is not really an emotion, right, praise is words, right, or whatever, okay, right, so, okay, it's more than emotion. Yeah, the eight winds are like eight types of obstacles, maybe that's another way of saying, yeah. I mean, but... As far as you know, this is originally in Chinese. Yeah. You, you translate. But the word when itself, are you saying like when something is like taking place, W H E N, versus or, or dealing with. Say it again. Win. You mean the win? Yeah, I mean like w win. W H E N or. W. Oh, no, no, not, not when. I mean, no. Win. 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 It's, it's a metaphor. Win means like, it's like, in this case, it would be like a headwind. You get it? Can yeah. Be moved. yeah, 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 yeah. Or something that will unexpected. No, no, no. Or something that will, like you say, yeah. perturb, disturb us. Yeah. Well, like when something happens and somebody like not when, when. Or, or, or somebody threw a pie in the face and say when a pie hit the face, you know the man got upset. Okay. So that, that's that's I mean realistically when you say well, you when can something or. But when a car hit somebody, they broke their arm. No, 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 no. Okay. It's so wind, the actual yeah. wind. Well, when, what do you mean, like wind, like when earth, wind, and fire? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. So it, because, because, fire, because as a metaphor, natural, right, to say, no, 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 no. It's a metaphor. It, it, it means that those eight things, those eight Wait, things, yeah. conditions, yeah, you can say eight, I don't say conditions, move, eight, eight they, things they, that they can, can move, disturb yeah. us, that can bother us you get it okay that, that's all okay that's what it means all right okay all right okay so so let's talk about what the near enemy is it's you can say equanimity remember we talk about impartiality non different it, it can mean indifference apathy non-motivation dullness passivity and nonchalant which is unmindful now indifference apathy even non-motivation because we talk about what your way wu wei right 
unconditioned and, and uh, or non-conditioned and conditional, right? Or motivated, unmotivated. You know, it doesn't seem negative, totally negative. Yeah, I'm indifferent to criticism. Yeah, that, that's not bad. That's not bad, right? You could say I'm indifferent. Right, 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 okay, right? I mean, you could say that, right? I mean, you could use that term. That's what I'm trying to say. So like, like I said, there's a lot of overlap, but, but then that some of them are like, you know, the nuances could be negative. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? So, so that's what the near enemy is. We've got to be careful about just indifference or apathy, apathy, right? You don't care, right? It's like you don't care, right? Or, you know, you know we can say apathy. I mean, apathy, indifference, there's overlap too. I mean, you know, if you look at a definition, they would say it's part of the synonym. Okay, they're each other. But it doesn't matter. Non motivation. Ah, okay, that's very interesting. Okay. Uh, didn't you say that we should be unconditional, non conditioned? Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Okay. It just means that this non motivation means that, let's kind of say, you don't, you, you don't, you don't feel an urge, okay, or you don't. I say you don't want to do anything, okay. You're just like lazy. You can say lazy, okay, all right. And then dullness, passivity. That that's what I'm saying. It's pretty close, okay. That means you're just passive. You you don't. I don't say you don't care. You just. You, it's like you don't care. <laughs> yeah, I mean passive, right? You know, passivity. That means you don't want to do anything about it. Maybe that's another term, right? You don't want to change, even though, you know, right? You just, you know, you don't care. Uncaring, yeah, oh, cares. And nonchalant, unmindful. Remember we talked about mindfulness before? <laughs> unmindful, you can say negligent, okay? So those are all very, you know, subtle, right? They're very subtle, that's what I'm trying to say, right? They're subtle nuances, right? Okay, you know, from a, from a, psychological point, I don't know, I don't want to go into psychology. You know, it's not necessarily bad, right? I mean, 100% bad, but it has nuances that, you know, may not be good, you know, okay, or may not be helpful. Maybe that's another term, okay? So let's go to point D. Now, the bad thing is really this, the negative, the real opposite or far enemy is that we talk about resentment. Mmm, yeah, you're really resentful, spiteful, you can say, okay? And greedy. What's, what's greed now? This, okay, because greed is pretty broad, right? In this case, it means what craving or grasping. Okay, you know you have. Uh, yeah, it leads to differentiation. That means that you know you have, what chi se, means what, like and dislike. Ooh, right. So of course, remember we talk about the eight winds. Of course, I like praise. Of course, I'm I crave praise, but I cannot stand criticism, right? All right, right, right? Same idea, okay? So that's not, you know, that's really bad, right? Okay, because now we're starting to be more, okay? To differentiate, so that's like differentiation. Now this differentiation is, is more specific. It talk about the four marks. What's the four marks of, of existence? The ego or the self, self-consciousness, okay? The personality, the being and the life, is that what it is? Yeah, okay. That's the translation. Uh, if you want to go to the glossary of terms, uh, I have to go into this. Anyway, uh, okay. Okay, ooh, okay. The four, if you guys want to look on page two, I believe, three, yeah. Okay, the four marks existence per Diamond Sutra. It's the ego, the differential personality, that means Subject, object, duality, there's a me and there's a you, right? Right, okay. Then there's the being, meaning that we, we tend to view that, oh yeah, we have a form, which is composed of the five skandhas, and we think that that's real. That's, that's you know, that's, that's real, constant, or whatever, okay? That's always, you know, real, okay, whatever, okay? And life, meaning that we see that, oh yeah, this life is precious. It's, it's not permanent, <laughs> but is something that we should grasp. Remember, grasping, cleaning, right? Okay, two, okay. Actually, these are all illusions, okay, from the Buddha's point of view, because these are all display, all these, all, all, all three, all four of them, display what we call the three marks of existence, which is anicca, means impermanence, 
uh, suffering, dukkha, suffering, and also uh, uh, um, anatta means without true self, meaning that these, even the ego, we think the ego is real, right? It's real. My consciousness is real. My self awareness is real. Actually, it's not <laughs> because it changes. It comes and goes. Okay, okay, but but that's technical. Okay, so I don't want to go into that. But anyway, okay. So 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 just understand that. Okay, all right. So oh, where are we? Okay, so that's the the real bad. Thing. Now the trap or the result that we have to try to avoid is that you know we say oh yeah we're impartial we're non-differentiating. Okay, uh, we 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 relinquish. We say ah oh, you know. Uh, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't cling to an ego or whatever. It becomes, it could lead potentially to uncaring. If we're not mindful, if we're not careful, you know, we just don't care, right? Or numbness or cold-heartedness. The purest, oh, you're pure, very cold-hearted. You don't care, right? You don't care. You have no, no sensitivity, no emotions, whatever, okay? Or you can say callousness or insensibility, okay? So that's the, the, if we don't practice, if we, if, if we don't, if we don't, uh, pers uh, practice equanimity or be mind uh, equanimity properly, this could potentially lead to that. Okay? All right, so we got to be careful. Now, so to more, be the, it just means that uh, we have a selfless, detached state of mind which helps prevent negative actions and is the basis for unconditional altruistic love and kindness, compassion, joy for others. Okay? So that's the, the first three components. So it's, you can say equanimity kind of like guides the, the other three, the first three states of mind, okay? Or immeasurable minds. It kind of keeps them on the right track, okay? Right. From, from going into those traps, remember? Uh, okay, all right, okay. And also it's the bodhisattva, which means the bodhi mind. It's the expression or the manifestation of bodhi mind. Uh, we have to define what body mind is, but but I'll talk about that. Did I talk about the four uh, virtues of nirvana? nirvana? Yeah, yeah, I did. I Anybody know what they are? Did I talk about it right up here? Right, the four virtues. Point E, Appendix A. What are they? What are they? What are they? Anybody know what they are? Appendix A. Okay, four virtues of nirvana. Transcendental reality is nirvana. The first one, it's it's you might say it's eternal. It's Eternal. Something that's eternal. Changeless, timeless. It's also blissfulness, happiness, joy. Uh, why? Because it's, we're self-sufficient, ten emancipations, freedoms, liberations, all that. There's a true self. That it's absolute, non-attached, non-dualistic, unmoving, unperturbed. Okay, no four marks. Right, those four marks we talked. And it's pure. That means it's non non-defilable, non-stainable, unblemished, impeccable. Impeccable means what? Perfect. You can say perfect, right? Perfect. Now, this doesn't map exactly say, oh, this goes, eternity goes to the first. No, no, no. Actually, the, the four immeasurable lines really comes from these, these three, okay? All right? Because we're, we're describing it from a different dimension, maybe, okay? Because these four, just describing in very broad generalities what, what are the qualities or virtues of in a nirvana state, okay? All right? Whereas the four measurable minds is the manifestation of this state. Make sense? Or, or, of these virtues, okay? It's a manifestation. You can say it's an expression. Why? Because it's in our mind already. It's that state of mind. You can say state of, this is not state of mind, right? This is not nothing to do with state of mind. You get it? This is nothing to do with state of mind. The four immeasurables coming from these, no, these three. Actually, it's four too, because remember I said it's timeless. Okay. Is a state of mind. Understand? Okay. So, get it? Okay. All right. So, so what I'm trying to say is that those immeasurable minds it doesn't come from our conscious mind or human nature or human consciousness. Understand? Okay, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to drive. Okay, all right, okay. All right, so that's equanimity, okay? Okay, now let's go to, oh, part four, which is 
interactions. Oh, I'm, I'm running a long time. Or interrelationships with the four stages. This is very important. Now, all the four components mutually support or sustain each other. Okay? So, for example, loving kindness, the first component, it guards compassion and mercy from pity and sentimentality. Because you, are sh you won't have this unattached or non-conditioned benevolence. So, remember we talk about the trap to avoid, right? So, that's what it is. You know, if we have compassion and mercy, but we don't have this non-conditioned mindset or whatever, or attached, or self, notion of self, we could fall into pity and sentimentality, right? Sentimentality. So, loving kindness kind of help guide or prevent compassion from falling into that or resulting in that in that trap okay so that's right they mutually support each other make sense okay actually yeah okay right. same thing it prevents compassion mercy from partiality partiality means what bias you can say bias right because uh, differentiation or aversion means you uh, avoid right you want to avoid something or you're fearful of, right something like that right fearful okay and it guards equanimity from indifference and numbness okay or cold heart uh, numbness you can say numbness I, I use cold heartedness next okay it just means that it means that it seems that you have no sensitivity okay that's what it means okay or all right okay all right okay compassion and mercy it reminds loving kindness so that's the first component and the third component that suffering still exists. Yeah, you can be loving, you know, you want others, you wish others to be happy, right? You wish others, you rejoice, in, but that's not it. That's not only it, right? That, don't forget that there's still suffering. So that's what compassion reminds us of that. Get it? Okay, so, so you don't fall, okay, into that trap of what? Delusional bliss, remember? Right? Delusional bliss. Okay, anyway. It prevents loving kindness and happy joy from turning to a state of self-satisfied attachment, hypocrisy. And, okay? It also, I think, it's, I don't know if it's self satisfied Maybe it's not. Okay? That means self-satisfied. Yeah, you could say delusional bliss. Un, you know, not ignorant bliss. Okay? Hypocrisy, lip service. That means it's, you know, you can say, what? Insincerity or whatever. Okay? And, and laziness. That means we don't do anything. Whereas compassion and mercy wants us to what urge us to act right to remember to help others right to help right to help okay all right and also it guards equanimity from falling to apathy right? apathy oh i don't care or cold-heartedness you know i have no no feelings whatsoever right or you know right no feelings you know okay so but compassion means you have feeling you feel pain remember suffering right okay okay Happy joy, or yeah. it develops compassion mercy into active sympathy as opposed to passivity. Remember, we talked about passivity as one of the traps or or or, or, or near enemies. Okay, and also it develops compassion mercy from being overwhelmed by suffering. Yeah. Okay. Happy joy because even though yeah, you know, compassion and mercy. Yeah. Sometimes you get so overwhelmed. By suffering because you realize that suffering is going to it's going to you know it's so great so much right that you know it seems like you know you can't even do anything to help to 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 to, re to mitigate it or minimize it okay but happy joy kind of reminds us that hey wait a minute there, we can also still rejoice vicariously in the happiness or joy of other people. Okay? Uh, uh, okay. Also, it gives equanimity the mild serenity that softens its indifferent and stern appearance. Because remember, I said one of the traps of equanimity is sometimes you appear to be indifferent, right? Or, you know, numb or, you know, cold hearted, frid frigid, right? All that. So, it, happy joy, kind of like, it's a balance. Maybe that's a better term. It balances or offset that trap that that uh, okay that that potential negative trap okay last is equanimity now the key is equanimity has to be rooted in the proper insight okay and so it becomes the guiding and restraining power for the three previous uh, the first three states that is it prevents loving kindness 
the first state, compassion, mercy, second state, and happy, joy, third state, from becoming, ending up selfish, pitifulness, enviousness, and complacency, okay? Um, what's that insight? What's that insight? The insight is understanding that it's part of our body mind. So it's nothing to do with our human conscious thoughts or emotions or, or yeah, emotions or feelings. Understand? Okay, it comes pure from, remember something I, we talk about, the, I talk, you know, Appendix A, the four virtues. It's something that's pure, remember? Right? Something that's everlasting. So it's not, it's constant. It doesn't come, come and go. All right? All right? Okay? It's not perturbed. Influence, right? Remember? Okay, all that. All right? It also gives loving kindness an even and changing firmness and patience. Okay? Loving kindness means that, what? We want, yeah, we want others to be happy and, 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 and be loved. So, it, with equanimity, remember we say that's unattached, that's sincere. It gives it unchanging. That's constant. Okay? Unbiased, is that unbiased, right? Impartial. And also, for instance, compassion with an even and ready courage and firm. Okay, the key is this equanimity is led by wisdom, okay? And it guides and sustains the three other states, okay? So it underlines the, the, the first three states, okay? It's deep sincerity and humility, okay? That's remember, it comes from renunciation and relinquishment, okay? So what are the four great vows? Woo, okay. Sorry. Okay, you guys can read it, right? However innumerable sentient beings are, I vow to save them all. However inexhaustible afflictions I vow to extend them. However immeasurable the dharmas are, I vow to master them. However incomparable the perfect enlightenment or Buddhahood is, I vow to achieve it. So these four great vows can be summarized as follows. The first one, it's a great vow because you want to save all sentient beings of all realms. <laughs> the second one is great compassion because you want to what? In the affliction, of all sentient beings, right? So that's called great compassion, okay? The third one is called great wisdom, which is to help all sentient beings master the dharmas, i.e., that's the however immeasurable the dharmas are vowed to master, okay? So the third vow is, I mean, the third vow, you can say, you can summarize it, right, remember, as a great wisdom, because that's what all the dharmas will lead to. When I say great wisdom, it's the maha prajna. It's the wisdom not coming from learning, but from our Buddha nature. Okay? Okay? All right. Okay? Or from the four, you know, virtues of nirvana. Okay? Same thing. And the last vow, however incomparable the perfect enlightenment of Buddhahood is, is called great practice. That means you want to what? Help all sentient beings to achieve enlightenment, achieve Buddhahood. Right? So that's, can, that's how we summarize those four great vow. That's, okay, you can say one is called great vow, great compassion, great wisdom, and great practice. Understand? Or cultivation. You can say cultivation. Okay? So the awakened Bodhi mind is actually summarized by the four vows. Ah, interesting. So that's where the relationship is. Okay? That's the connection. Understand? So that's why when we say four immeasurable minds can be summarized or embodied by what the four great vows make sense okay and so what is the relationship to the four immeasurable minds so benevolence loving kind is embodied by the first vow compassion mercy embodied by the second vow equanimity record embodied by the third vow happy joy sympathetic records embodied by the fourth vow okay now there are some buddha bodhisattva sorry because these are bodhisattva vows that are associated with these vows. You know that? Okay, the first one, first great vow is who? Siddhigarbha. Why? What was his vow? He said, he's not a Buddha until there are no sentient beings suffering in the underworld. So that's a great vow because he wants to save not just living beings, but also sentient beings in the underworld. So that's a great vow. Make sense? Okay. Avalokitesvara, or better known as Guan Yin, what's his or her vow? It's great compassion. What did Guan Yin vow? It says, she is not a Buddha until all those who are suffering no longer are free from suffering. Wow. So that's compassion, right? She wants to eliminate the suffering of all sentient beings. Okay? 
So that's the second great power. Make sense? Manjursi, we rarely talk about him. <laughs> okay, he's Wen Su. Okay, that's Chinese Wen Su. It embodies great wisdom, which is the third vow, which is really equanimity, relinquishment. Okay, okay. Great wisdom. What does that mean? It just means that if we can master all the Dharma teachings, what result? Wisdom. Get it? Okay. Wisdom. Okay. Now this is called Maha Prajna. Okay. It's you can say it's Buddha nature wisdom. It's it literal translation means great wisdom, but okay. So it just means wisdom that gives you direct insight without needing to what use reasoning or cognitive without using cognitive process. Okay, that's what it means. And anybody heard of Samantha Tabra? Chinese term is Pu Xian. Pu Xian, right? It's Pu Xian, yeah, Pu Xian. It's, it's called Great Practice. Why? I, I, I didn't write it down, but it's in chapter 40 of Avatasaka Sutra, which is well known, it's most well known, it's called the Ten Great Vows of Samantha Tabra. Okay, which means that he vowed to practice yeah, to diligently practice, learn, you know, not not only the you know the, the Dharma, but learn to, you know, you know, we say cultivate, okay, or say, you know, to become enlightened, okay? So that's called practice. Remember the fourth, what's the fourth uh, fourth vow? It's to great practice to help all sentient beings achieve enlightenment. Okay? That he says he vowed that he wants to do this so that all sentient beings can follow the practice that he set up. You know, it's like a guide to achieve enlightenment, okay? All right, so that's what uh, Samantha Tarpa is known for, okay? As uh, he took a vow, the fourth great vow, which is great practice, okay? Uh, I don't want to do conclusion, right? As a matter of fact, I, I, you know, this is a little bit more aside, but I don't know if we have enough time. Actually, the four great vows also, A, B, C, D here, okay? Also are connected to the Four Noble Truths, you know that? Everybody know what the Four Noble Truths are? Appendix C. Here you go. Truth of suffering. Existence of suffering or dukkha. Okay. And the cause of that suffering is ignorance, which leads to wrong views, da da da, etc. etc. Third one is there is a way to cease that suffering, that is to relinquish the desires and that, that ties us to some, the state of i.e. that there is that state called nirvana, which will eliminate or end suffering. Get it? Okay, or, okay. And then the fourth one is that there is a method, you can say a method, a path of, of ending that suffering, okay, okay, which is through the, pra in specific in this case, because the Four Noble Truths is part of the, what, a full path, right? A, a full noble path, okay? So what's the link? What's the, this, what's the link to this between the Four Noble Truths and the Four Great Vows. Actually, the f first Great Vow is this. It's, it's, so so the, the first Great Vow, as you can say, is will handle this, the first truth. Get it? Okay. The second Great Vow, or second, sorry, <laughs> Vow, <laughs> it, is will handle or deal with the cause of suffering. Okay? All right, the, the third vow, oh, the, the, sorry, the third vow here is talk about path, right? Cultivation, dharma, method is this, okay? That's the third vow. And the fourth vow is what? Achieving enlightenment in nirvana, right? That way, there's no more suffering, okay? Uh, anybody, right? Understand? Okay? So that, that's the connection, okay? So, from the Four Noble Truths, you can link all the way to the Four Immeasurable Minds via the Four Great Vows. Make sense? So, wow, so that ties everything up, okay? So, uh, there's a couple other points. Uh, let, let's see, I, I don't know if I, if I say it in my conclusion. Okay, I'm gonna do conclusion now, all right? Uh, let's do conclusion, okay, okay. Okay, it's fundamental 
because it's the foundation of the four great vows, okay, the, the immeasurable minds. And it's integral, that means it's part of it, it's, it's a integral, that means it's, 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 it's it, can't, it can't be separated, okay? It's the manifestation of our four virtues of nirvana, right? Which I talked about. And it's essential, why? Because the awakening of our Bodhi mind is necessary to achieve Bodhisattvahood, okay? The Bodhi mind, remember, comes from our Buddha nature, right? Remember, okay? All right, so it's not from our human nature, okay? And it's important because it translates space time. It's limitless, timeless. So those four great vows, uh, sorry, yeah, the four great vows. Remember I said earlier the four measurable minds are eternal, timeless, limitless, and all that stuff. So therefore, therefore, the four great vows likewise are the same. Make sense? Therefore, eternity. They're not for, oh, a vow that you just make for this lifetime or you try to fulfill. It's timeless too. It's, it spans endless eons. Get it? So that's why City Garba, Avalokitesvara, uh, Manjursi, Samantha Tabra, their bodhisattva vows, those vows that they came, is timeless. It's for eternity. For countless eons. Get it? Okay? So that's why it's called Four Great Vows. <laughs> Make sense? Okay? They're timeless and eternal. Uh, let's see, there's one more thing. Okay, yeah, let me, I didn't put it down. Um, what's the, um, in the suffering? It says, for one who clings, motion exists. Ooh, that means it's perturbed. There's, there's a disturbance or, a, you know, the eight winds, right? That, uh, but for one who clings not, there is no motion. Ah. For where no motion is, there's stillness. Where stillness is, there's no craving, right? Okay. Where no craving is, there's neither coming nor going. Ah, okay. Whether, where no coming nor going is, there is neither arising nor passing away. You know, you can say up and down, something that comes and goes, okay? Where neither arising nor passing away is, there is neither this world nor a world beyond, okay? Nor a state between. This is the end of suffering. Okay, so, so, so that means, you know, it kind of embodies what the four immeasurable minds are, okay, that, you know, we, you know, we should not have, you know, cleaning, craving, grasping, any of that stuff, okay? So we have to be, have a prior understanding of what the four immeasurable minds are, okay, because they why is there no craving, grasping, differentiation, you know, uh, four marks, etc., et Because it's part of our Bodhi mind, i.e., our Buddha nature, which is what we, we talk about the four, right? The four virtues and not. Is that it's, you can say it's perfect, it's self sufficient, right? It's blissful. And we say blissful because we have to give it <laughs> a description, right? Okay, actually, at the highest level, it's thusness, suchness, okay? It just is, just is. That's the way our Buddha nature is. So therefore, our immeasurable mind, or Bodhi mind, is this, it's thus, just so. No, you don't have to give a reason. There's no reasoning. There's no need to, to rationalize it. Make sense? Okay, so, so that's it. Okay, I'm sorry, there's a lot to absorb. Um, uh, I'll end this now. So now you are, hopefully you have a, a little bit deeper understanding <laughs> more in-depth uh, understanding uh, of, uh, of what the four immeasurable minds are and therefore what the four great vows are, okay? Okay, so there are a lot of things maybe I didn't say correctly. I beg uh, the Buddha's forgiveness. Thank you very much. Wow.